try to get through as many of them as possible. So we have some index cards, and we're going to pass these around, starting at uh, both sides of the room. So when it gets to you, please take one. That's what these are for.
Um, uh, I'm Larry Michelle. I'm the president of the Economic Policy Institute, also the uh, director of our education research program. Uh, very pleased to have all you here. We're really honored uh, to have Diane Ravitch here to talk about her book. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Diane Ravitch has got the only good thing happening in the world of education. <laughs> Wish her well uh, and one life um, and, uh, and health. Um, our, uh, today we're going to have Diane speak, followed by some comments by Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, and then some comments uh, from Elaine Weiss, who is the director of the Broader Boulder Approach to Education, and then we'll have Q&A. Uh, Randy is uh, about to arrive, but I figure probably heard what Diane has to say, so we might as well get that started and not keep you all waiting anymore. There's bio information that was already provided to you, so I'm not going to give any extensive uh, introduction to everybody. Uh, they're, they're well known people, and uh, you should measure people by, uh, by what they say. So with that, um, Diane, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Larry, for hosting me here today, and thank you also for not making any reference to my resume, because what he does, I have to say, well, wait a minute, I got kicked out of that one, uh, and the one I didn't get kicked out of, I resigned from. So, so EDI, I'm happy to be associated with, even though I'm not a fellow, I am a very um, happy visitor. Uh, my book has been uh, amazing, and when people ask me why... I wrote a second book following a one called Death and Life. It was the two things that came together. Uh, one was that I was being followed by David Wendy of the New Yorker writing profiles, and he said, your critics, the manager and my critics, when they say you don't have solutions, you only have criticism. And I said, well, you just heard me give a speech at the Education Law Center. You know, I have lots of solutions. And he said, well, write a book. So if somebody tells you to write a book, you write a book, right? <laughs> I spent last summer writing a book. And then I learned the secret to writing a book. And I shared it with a few young people who asked me how to do it. And I said, look, I've been blogging now for, I don't know, about eight years. And when you look at the book, you don't think book. You think, I'm writing a blog. This chapter's a blog. That chapter's a blog. It's so easy. You can write 30 blogs if you're up for it. <laughs> Hi, Randy. Hi, Brian. Oh, so she misses all the funny jokes at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there was a second reason that I wrote the book, and that was because at the same time that David Wendy made his big suggestion, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations brought out a report uh, co-chaired by Joel Klein and Condoleezza Rice, in which they said that American public education was so terrible that it had become a very grave national security threat. And I found that very offensive. Uh, I didn't believe it. So I decided to do some fact checking, and I couldn't find their facts, um, and it just didn't make any sense. So those two things together made me realize that this is a different book. The first part of the book is the facts, the facts about test scores, the facts about graduation rates, the facts about the international press, those kinds of things. And then the other part of the book is what I call the solutions. So I'd like to begin today with just this kind of simple thought, which is what do the most admired school systems in the world do? First of all, they have public school systems. They do not have charters. They do not have vouchers. I did the experiment a couple of years ago and saw that their emphasis there is in having an excellent public school in every conceivable neighborhood and part of the country. And Cosby Schomburg, who is the leading expert on fairness education said, we aim for equity and we got excellence. And it took them 30 years. They didn't do it overnight. It wasn't a two or three year deal. It was a 30 year project. He wrote about this in his book, Finished Lessons. Um, the second thing that the excellent school systems in the world have is a highly respected education profession. Uh, teachers work hard to develop their craft. They're well prepared, they're well trained before they become teachers. There is no teacher training. And <laughs> when when um, actually a young
young people from in high school who need to teach in career and they apply to eight institutions. There are only eight teacher training institutions and my teacher, she only standardized training on general and she's a teacher trainer. And so they apply from high school and only one out of ten is accepted, only the best of the best. And they have to pass tests, they have to write essays, they have to write work recommendations, blah, blah, blah. Now, I want to show you that they spend five years of study, not just studying education, studying subject matter, mastering the subject, learning how to teach children with disabilities, um, and practice teaching and guidance for five years they're teachers. And they join a union, and everyone in the union, and in general, and all the teachers and all the principals who want to extend the union, which is one of the interests. So teachers with a highly respected profession, not only are teachers well prepared and professional, uh, but the very best teachers are principals, the master teachers, and their superintendents are educators. They do not hire admirals, generals, social workers, lawyers, businessmen, and everybody else with any possible background uh, to lead their school systems. We're moving in the opposite direction. So the first job in my book and as I mentioned, what I tried to do was to establish the facts. And I didn't just say, this is my opinion about the facts. I persuaded my publisher to allow me to print 40 graphs, uh, which was unusual for Kanaf. They don't generally put uh, graphs into their books, but they agreed in this case because it was so important to be able to demonstrate we really have made incredible progress over the past 40 years. And the test scores that I look at are the test scores of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, because there are no stakes tests. Nobody knows who's going to take them. Uh, no individual student takes the entire test. No student ever gets a score. Schools don't get scores. There are no rewards or punishments attached to them. And the NAEP scores show, since 1971 or so, the scores have gone up. In the case of black and Hispanic students, dramatically in some cases. Um, but the odd thing is, I, held, I withheld the publication of the book until June of 2013, because that was when the last NAEP um, came out. It's called the Long-Term Trend. Uh, there are two different NAEPs. A lot of people don't realize this. There's the one that's given every other year, and that's main NAEP, and the framework changes from time to time. And then there's something called Long-Term Trend NAEP. That's given every four years, and the questions never change. They're very basic <coughs> questions about math and reading. The only thing that changes is that occasionally uh, obsolete terms drop out. When I was on the NAGB board, uh, we had to remove a question about SNH green stamps. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, it's the same test that was given in 1970. And the scores went up and up, and I waited for the 2012 long-term trend to come out, and something astonishing happened. The scores from 2008 to 2012 were flat. So with all the emphasis that we have on testing, 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 testing. The one thing that didn't happen was the scores did not go up. Uh, for most of the groups, there were some small gains with, for a couple of groups, but the kind of dramatic change we had seen over the previous 40 years went flat with the merger of No Child Left Behind and the race to the top. But the story that I found looking at NAEP, main NAEP as well as the long-term trend rate is that test scores have gone up steadily and significantly in reading over the past 40 years for all groups, for white kids, black kids, Hispanic kids, and Asian kids. Um, the graduation rates, test scores today are the highest they've ever been in history, by the way, on this no stakes test. Uh, the graduation rates are the highest they've ever been in history. And uh, again, for black students, white students, Hispanic students, Asian students, and there are two different ways of calculating the graduation rate. You can take the most conservative way, which the U.S. Department of Education does, and uh, look only at the kids who started ninth grade and ended exactly in May or June of senior year. That rate is now 78.2%. That's the highest it's ever been. But if you look at the U.S. Census data, amongst the age group from 18 to 24, 90% have a high school diploma. Why is that? Because the most conservative way of calculating does not include students who graduated in August, students who took five years, students who took six years, and students who got a GED, but they all count. So dropout rates, we've often heard about the dropout crisis. Dropout rates today are the lowest they've ever been in history. All of these are data taken from the 
uh, website of the U.S. Department of Education. The dropout rates are the lowest they've ever been in history for black students, Hispanic <coughs> students, Asian students, and white students. International scores, uh, what you have to understand is first international test was given in 1964. Um, we, had, we took it in two grades, eighth grade and twelfth grade. There were twelve nations that took the test. In one grade we came in next to last, and in the other one we came in dead last. Um, in the ensuing 50 years, our nation has outperformed all the other 11 nations by every conceivable measure you can imagine, whether it's economic growth, economic productivity, technological innovation, creativity, democratic institutions, the number of patents, uh, whatever it is, every number you can think of, we have outperformed the other 11. Over the past uh, 50 years, we've typically performed in the middle or even on the bottom quartile on the international test because we don't excel at teaching test taking until recently. So in the, in the te when you hear people talk about we're number 14 or 16 or 17 or whatever number they're talking about, they're always talking about the test called PISA that came out in 2010. The test they don't talk about is called TEMS. That came out in December of 2012. On the TEMS, our kids did incredibly well. We're getting much better at test taking. Uh, so, bless you. With so much practice, we should be getting better. Our fourth and eighth graders tied with the children of Finland in mathematics. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and the only countries that consistently outscored us on the Thames were the Asian Tigers, Singapore, Japan, Korea, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, but they have test-taking cultures. And it's almost every other week that I read an article in, a, in somewhere or another, or it's sent to me, saying the Minister of Education in Japan, China, Korea, Singapore, wherever, is trying to figure out how they can be more like the American system and be more creative and innovative and have less emphasis on test taking. So our greatest strength, what has made this country, I believe, such a powerful and successful country, is not test scores, but creativity, thinking differently, uh, what one Indian commentator in my book refers to is the spirit, the spirit that American students have, the sense of innovation and ingenuity. We invent things. We think of new ways to do things. Our current regime of high-stakes testing threatens to kill the very qualities that have made this country great and have made this country the envy of the world. And just the other day I was talking with a friend who just returned from five years in China. He was running a chemical plant there, uh, and the stories he told me curled my hair uh, about the lack of concern for safety and, uh, and accurate labeling and things like that. But he said he had a number of wonderful young Chinese uh, engineers working for him. They all had bachelor's degrees. They were well-educated. And he said, where do you want to take your work and your master's degree? And of his 15 engineers, 14 of the 15 wanted to come to the U.S. And he said, why? And they said, freedom. It's the freedom, it's the spirit, it's the chance to do new things and be different. That's what we have. Let's not kill it. But we are on a harmful quest, I believe, to pursue through high-stakes testing the standardization of the nation and to worship credentialism instead of nonconformity. So many children in so many states will be denied high school diplomas who might have a very useful life if we can find a route for them to get the diploma they need, even if it's a GED, so that they can participate in American life. Uh, it's, I saw it recently estimated that a third of the children in Texas may fail the high stakes graduation exam. Um, the same may be true in Rhode Island because they've adopted a standardized test in Rhode Island as the high school graduation exam. And you're, it, it's, for, it's actually, you can foretell the percentage of kids who will not graduate high school. So in the book, I um, describe various hoaxes. Uh, sorry to use such a harsh word, but I believe they are hoaxes. No Child Left Behind is a hoax, was a hoax, still is a hoax. Um, I mentioned earlier in a conversation with reporters that right after No Child Left Behind was passed, uh, I was at an event in the Willard Hotel, and my former boss, Lamar Alexander, was on the panel, and I stood up and said, uh, Senator Alexander, uh, do you really believe that 100% of the children in this country will be proficient in math and reading by the year 2014? And he said, well, no, we don't actually believe that, Diane, but we, do, we think it's good to have goals. 
Well, it's good to have goals, but in the meanwhile, when you have unrealistic goals, unattainable goals, people are losing their jobs, people are being fired, people are having their reputation destroyed, schools are being closed because of goals that Congress knew were unattainable when they passed it. That's what I call a hoax. I could go on and talk about the Texas miracle. That, too, is a hoax. I, won't be able to <coughs> uh, I believe that Race to the Top is a hoax. Race to the Top has put almost $5 billion into the pursuit of higher test scores. What if that same $5 billion had been spent with this goal? The, the money will go to communities that come up with the best plan to promote desegregation in their district. Wouldn't we have a different country today? Wouldn't there be a chance that the country would be different if we had pursued desegregation, integration, rather than higher test scores? We don't have higher test scores. And so many of those higher test scores have been purchased at the price of getting rid of the arts, forgetting about music, forgetting about all the things that give children joy in learning. And now we have kindergarten children taking bubble and standardized tests. This is insane. So we have today that test scores are the goal of education. And I say they're not the goal of education. Private schools don't believe they're the goal of education. Finland doesn't believe they're the goal of education. Parents don't believe they're the goal of education. Good citizenship is the goal of education. We created public education in the United States because we knew that as a democratic society we were in peril of losing what we have, which is our basic democracy. And that the most important thing we could do would be to educate the next generation so that they would be able to vote wisely. They're going to choose our leaders. They have to be able to be prepared to serve on a jury. You might be in the docket, and these kids will be choosing your fate. They have to be able to weigh evidence. They have to be able to think. They have to be able to decide so that you get a fair trial and so that we have good people chosen for our leaders. Uh, good test scores. I'm not against good test scores. I have good test scores. I have really great test scores, but I don't think that that makes me a better person than anybody else. I'll bet you that the people who are leading Enron and Madoff had great test scores. <laughs> test scores are not a, a testament to character. And I don't think, and we know and one of the good things about this country is there are many different ways to be successful. Some of them require a high degree of whatever that is that's measured by the test, uh, but many of them don't, thank goodness. Standardized tests, it turns out, or a mirror of family wealth and family education. And the kids who will have the highest scores will most likely be the kids who are children of affluence, and the children with the lowest scores who are in the bottom half of the normed curve are those who have not had the advantages in life. Standardized tests do not measure capacity to learn, they measure opportunity to learn. And we're not providing opportunity to learn on an equal basis. So the purpose of tests, and I'm not against testing per se, but I think that we're misusing tests. Tests should be used diagnostically. Tests should be used to identify which kids need extra help and make sure that they get it. Tests should be used by the teacher to find out what is it that I didn't teach well because the kids didn't understand it. And teachers don't learn this from the standardized test because the results come back so late that the teacher has no idea what the kids didn't learn, and by the time the results come back, very often the kids have a different teacher. So the, we had last spring the first Common Core test in New York, and the tests were given in April. The results came back in August. The kids didn't even have the same teacher anymore, and then when the scores came in, the teachers were not allowed to see where the students had done well or poorly. So there was no diagnostic purpose whatsoever in the test. They were only used for ranking and rating, giving labels to the children, giving labels to the teachers, and giving labels to the schools so that certain schools would be set up for failure. Now, it's important to understand that there's no other nation in the world that tests every child every year. We're the only ones that do it. We are copying the Texas miracle that wasn't. We're still copying it. Now, what I began to see as I was writing the book was that what the testing had become was a setup for failure. And particularly in those states that have grades for schools, an A through F grading system, they're setting up the schools that, that will fail and that will be handed over to private 
entrepreneurs or to uh, other private operators, some for profit, some not for profit. But whichever it is, it's a transfer of public funds from um, public from the public to private management. The ATF rating systems are notoriously unreliable. Uh, in my own neighborhood in Brooklyn, the neighborhood school was an A one year, and everybody came to celebrate and say the school should be made larger, and it was had a wonderful mixture of kids from the projects and kids from the brownstones, and it was a wonderful school. Six weeks later, the grades came out, and the same school was an F. And I went to see the principal, and I said, I don't understand what happened. He said, neither do I. <laughs> we have the same principal, you know, I'm the same, the teachers are the same, the kids are the same, nothing changed, and we went from an A to an F. That's how crazy this is, and it's insane that state after state is doing this, and it's demoralizing to schools, and it does nothing to help them. And imagine if your child came home from school with a report card that had a letter on it. That doesn't make any sense. And a whole school has is, is got lots and lots of kids. You cannot judge an institution with a letter grade. So we have this outrageous misuse, overuse, and abuse of standardized testing which is now used to label children, fire teachers and principals, and close schools. It's what I call a tsunami of bad ideas uh, that's being used really to wreck American public education. It's wrecking the profession, first of all, by pretending that inexperienced college graduates with a few weeks of training are highly qualified. That's just what was added to the budget deal this week, that five weeks of training and a college diploma is all you need to be considered highly qualified. Thanks, Congress. <laughs> that's, that's the value of having Teach for America staff interwoven through the congressional offices to take care of Teach for America, which has $300 million in the bank. Uh, part of the, this dismantling of the profession is the pursuit of a metric that can evaluate teacher quality. This is a pursuit that will fail. You cannot say who the best teachers are and who the worst teachers are based on test scores. You can say who's best at uh, encouraging kids to, uh, to, who's best at teaching to the test. But if you're teaching kids who are autistic, you're not going to have high test scores. If you're teaching kids who are English learners, you're not going to have high test scores. If you're teaching gifted kids who are already at the ceiling, you're not going to see big test score gains either. So there are all kinds of problems, and the kids are not randomly assigned. So the research is overwhelmingly opposed to the use of test scores to evaluate teachers. Uh, the main thing that this method does is to demoralize and discourage teachers. The single most obvious cause of low academic performance is not the teacher. We are not overrun with bad teachers, contrary to the belief of race at the top. The single most obvious cause is poverty. Uh, our country is number one in child poverty amongst the advanced nations of the world. 23% uh, of our kids live in poverty. The number is even higher amongst African American children and Hispanic children. Uh, when I heard Kazi Salberg speaking a couple of weeks ago here in D.C., he said he, he wanted to propose a thought experiment. He said, suppose you switch the teachers of Finland, who are all highly trained, with the teachers of Indiana, who are a mixed lot. Some of them are excellent, some are not excellent, whatever, but switch them. He says, I predict there would be no difference. The reason being that the highly trained teachers in Finland would be simply overwhelmed by the poverty of the children in Indiana. They would not know how to handle the social problems, the, the uh, tremendous problems that the kids bring with them to school. And the less well-trained teachers from Indiana would simply glow when faced with the wonderful teaching and learning conditions in the schools of Finland, where the poverty is very low, and that would not be one of their problems. So I think we are trying to, we're not trying to solve the real problem we have, which is child poverty, family poverty, community poverty. Returning education, or trying to turn education into an exercise of big data. I've recently been reading books about big data. The idea being that you can make decisions about people and institutions by never actually looking at anything, just numbers. <laughs> and, I, and I recently was sent by a friend in Meridian, Mississippi, an editorial from the local newspaper. They had constantly been complaining about the high school and how it was a terrible school, terrible scores, terrible kids, 
violence in the hallways, everything bad that you could possibly write. And my friend was invited to be a member of the editorial board, and he invited the whole board to come with him to see Meridian High School, which apparently they'd never been to. And he walked them through, and they wrote an editorial saying, we were astonished to discover a dedicated principal, well-behaved students, uh, wonderful teachers, clean hallways, everything that we thought was true was wrong. They had only looked at the data. They hadn't used their eyes. So I'm a great believer in the combination of data plus eyes. Data without eyes is blind. So the test, in my view, have become a tool for the privatization movement, setting schools up to fail and to be closed. But I personally believe that there are very few, if any, failing schools in America. The term failing school didn't even exist until the late 1990s. And one of my former graduate students did a LexisNexis search on the term failing schools and it didn't appear until the late 1990s. People seem to understand, people before the late 1990s had much more sense than we do today. <laughs> they understood that schools with low test scores need help, that the students need more support, they need more resources, they need smaller classes, they need more supervision. They don't need to be closed. Closing them does not help children learn to read. Closing them does not teach anyone math. And closing schools is a cop-out. When any school district closes a school, the leadership of the district should be held accountable for their failure. So on the question of choice, I'm very much, because of my advanced age, the words of George Wallace keep ringing in my ears, and Strom Thurmond. And many of my younger audiences have no idea who George Wallace and Strom Thurmond were. Uh, but I know who they were. I lived through that era. I went to segregated schools. I remember what choice was. Choice meant that the black kids went here and the white kids went there. And if you um, changed and had the ground decision and still had choice, the black kids go here and the white kids go there. It's all the same thing, only they chose to do this. What we're doing now, I'm afraid, is to recreate a dual school system of publicly funded schools. One set of schools getting public funds is free to exclude students with disabilities, free to exclude English language learners, and free to kick out kids who are difficult to teach. The other set of publicly funded schools will be the dumping grounds where the kids go that didn't get into the first set or got kicked out of the first set. Um, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's America. I don't think that's democracy. I don't think that's equality of educational opportunity. Uh, I would also suggest, and I know that it's controversial to say it, but I don't mind being controversial. Uh, when you reach 75, you can say things you couldn't say when you were 73. <laughs> Charters are not public schools. And the reason I say this is it's true that they get public money, but so does Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. It, so does Boeing. I can think of lots of places that get public money uh, who, that are not public. But in the case of charters, they have actually gone to court and argued we are not public institutions. Uh, in the Ninth Circuit Court in, in California, uh, where an employee had sued the charter school because his rights were violated, the charter defense was we are not a public agency. We are a private institution. And the courts agreed, you're private, you're not public. Uh, in Chicago, where a group of teachers, the charter school voted to organize, they wanted to join the union. Uh, the charter said, you can't, we're not subject to state labor law. We are a private institution. They went to the National Labor Relations Board, which agreed the charter school was a private, not a public agency. Uh, in New York, the charters resisted being audited by the state controller. They said, you have no right to audit the public funds you give us because we are private agencies. Okay, and then just a few weeks ago, there were charter founders in California who were convicted of misappropriating $200,000 from their charter schools. And the California Charter Schools Association entered an amicus brief and said, charter schools are not public agencies. They cannot be held to the same standards as public agencies. Uh, these laws do not apply to them. They can use this public money however they want. OK, you know, if the charter schools keep saying they're private, I'll go with that. They're private. It's OK. So what we have here, and I think this is the serious issue, is the question of consumerism versus civic obligation. And I think what the charter movement, despite the fact that there are some good charter schools, 
Uh, it encourages us as Americans to believe that where you send your children is simply a consumer choice and you have no obligation to support public education because it's where the other kids go. I think we all have an obligation to support public education, whether you use it or not, whether you send your children to private school, religious school, or have, whether they're homeschooled, or whether you have no children at all. Because a public school is like, to me, it's part of the commons, like public beaches, public parks, public roads. There is a responsibility on the part of the public to maintain public education, just as we have a responsibility for all of those other things. We cannot make it into a consumer choice. So um, the big issue, and I'll end there so that other people can speak. <laughs> Thank you. Is that um, the big issue is, and the one that I find obnoxious, is when the reformers say that poverty is just an excuse for bad teachers. Poverty is the elephant in the room. And as long as we have this dramatic income inequality that we have in the United States, there's no school reform that's going to change that. We're not going to save children one at a time from poverty. We have to make big changes in our country. We should not tolerate having 23% or more, or 40, in some cases 40% of our kids living in poverty. That's the big issue, not school reform. Thank you. essentially the following. They basically have used um, the austerity and the recession that we were in to create further austerity to cut the budgets of schools. And when you cut the budget of schools, then you don't have to go back to the taxpayers and say, you actually have to, in a tough time, you actually have to pay for the choice of investing in education. So, it pretty much goes like, do huge cuts to schools, starve the public schools, particularly those of kids who need the most. Talk about that in a second. Then say over and over and over and over again, in a way that nobody can say anything else or break through, schools are failing, 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 schools are failing and schools are failing some more. And then, all of a sudden say, and parents deserve more. Of course parents deserve more. Of course kids deserve more. And then say, people like us are the status quo, who, you know, are fighting for these failing, awful schools that parents deserve more for, or more with, 
And so the only thing left is these reckless, sorry, they don't say reckless, the only thing left are these alternatives that are now cropping up, and when you follow the money, cyber charters, if you have mass closures, all sorts of franchise charters, or now vouchers. And then they never actually say, because these things have been around for about 10, 12 years, and look, I've started some charters, I'm an engager. I engage in these movements as much as I can, because I try to find common ground. But then, when the evidence is out there that says, wait a second, I told you I promised props. <laughs> this was not written by anyone I employ <laughs> from Politico, Stephanie Simon saying vouchers don't do much for kids. This was not written by anybody we employ that says the walk to a better school that puts lives at risk by MSNBC doing an intensive study into what has actually happened in Philadelphia this year with all the closures of schools. And if I sound angry, I am angry. I've been in that district. I've seen what Corbett has done to those schools and those kids, whether I was in jail or out of jail. to invoke God. What are we going to do to help educate all of God's children? And so I am very, um, I, I am really grateful that Diane wrote this second book on these topics because if you don't break through and actually challenge some of the mythology then you don't actually get to what the Boulder Coalition has tried to do or what we've tried to do, which is answer the following two questions. And now I'm going to sit down. Question number one is, what set, what is, or three questions, what is the purpose of education? Frankly, the purpose of public education, in our judgments, is three or four things. Yes, of course it is the propeller of economy. Of course we need to help figure out what skills and knowledge children need so they can be the economic citizens they need to do to propel our economy. Second, what about the skills and knowledge children actually need so they can be great civic citizens in the greatest democracy in the world? And third, what about the children themselves? What do they need so that they can live a great life? So they, cannot, they can both dream their dreams and achieve them. We have all three purposes. And if those are our all three purposes, then the second question becomes, okay, what do we do to get there? to help enable not only access but opportunity, but second, I'm sorry, this is the third question, what's the accountability system around those goals? So what we're saying about how to get there is that's part of our Reclaim the Promise of Public Education. We have, you know, we have four or five prescriptions. Welcoming, safe, collaborative environments. First, you start with great neighborhood public schools. Not that they're all the same, from pre-K to various multiple pathways to graduation. That could include great career tech ed, high quality schools. But welcoming, safe,
collaborative environments. Number two, something Diane said a lot. We have to have well-prepared teachers who are supported, have time to collaborate, and the tools like lower class size to do their jobs. And look, if they can't do their jobs, they shouldn't be there. But we have to have a good enough evaluation system that actually helps assess that. Number three, curriculum. What do you call it? Standards. I know standards and curriculum are not the same. But the standards have to be aligned to what kids need to know and be able to do to be successful in life. But there has to be an engaged curriculum underneath that that is also about engagement of art, music, sciences. But it also has to be engaged enough and deep enough so that we are actually teaching critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, and doing something that actually I think is more important now than anything else, which is persistence and resilience. Because what we need to do with kids particularly for poor kids, is that we have to actually help them get up when they fall. And help them have the confidence to know that they can. And the confidence to be able to then live life like that. This is not my words, this is Paul Tuff and others. How do we do that? And last is, and Diane said this too, and this is, look, Larry Michelle will love that I'm using this fact. Ed Muir has gave me this fact a week ago and it is roiling in my head. Talk about poverty, not just the fact that Lindsay Layton this week talked about how we see, I used to use statistics that says one out of two um, kids in our public schools are poor. Lindsay this week told me that I was wrong. It's greater than that in the West and the South. What's happened in America, the largest income gap that we've had, I don't know, since before the Great Recession, Great Dis Depression. For 100 years. Thank you, for 100 years. Going farther than that. But this is what this means. Retirement security. For families that are close to retirement, households that are close to retirement, the median average savings the median savings for these families, $12,000. You think about the stress in that household. Retirement, there's a new word AARP told me for retirement. It's called work. <laughs> <laughs> and of all the new income generated in the last four years from 09 to 12, 95% of it was generated by the 1%. So don't tell me poverty doesn't matter here in the United States of America right now. So the question becomes, what do we do in schools to deal with that? Because we are the great opportunity engine. We are the only real highway. So that's why we've said, let's do wraparound services around schools like in Cincinnati, like in Syracuse, so that we try to address social emotional issues. Like we try to make sure that kids have a place to go after school. That's what we're talking about in terms of reclaiming the promise, very similar to the Boulder Initiative. But then the third piece is this. Whether we're right or wrong, or others are right or wrong, what's the accountability system around the kind of skills and knowledge we think kids really need to do and around the purposes of education? And that's the accountability system we all should be working on, not people doubling down on whether testing is good or bad. And I would argue that in this period of time of massive dysfunction in the United States government, where there will be no re-upping of ESEA in the next few years, at least my prediction, let's spend the time figuring out what are the purposes of education? How do we actually do those things in a public square, using the evidence that we see, and also opening things up for great innovation, and then third, what's the accountability system around those purposes, around the skills and knowledge that, ki that kids really need, so that once and for all, we stop the stupidity of kids being test scores. Thank you very much.
Markov doesn't help, so I'm leaving as well. So, thank you, Randy, also for not putting the mic too high for me. Um, before today, I believed that Larry really, really liked me, but now that I realize that he made me talk after Diane and Randy, maybe he doesn't like me as much as I thought. Um, so I want to also thank Diane so much on behalf of EPI, on behalf of BBA, for writing an amazing book, an important book, um, a book that is both long overdue and could probably not have been written one minute earlier, um, oddly enough. Um, it busts more myths than I can think about that really needed busting. Um, it has more charts busting those myths than I can think about. Um, the evidence, especially on the multiple impacts of poverty and race and segregation um, and economic isolation are tremendous and really show how they are the big impediments to teaching and learning and that's critical. Um, it's critically important that this comes from a real education scholar um, so that we start to reclaim, I think, what education expert means. Um, and it's very important that it marries those very cogent, um, well-constructed critiques of what's going wrong now with what could go right, has gone right, and I think will go right going forward. Um, I want to put out to all of you a thought experiment that this book inspired in me. I was talking with a colleague a few weeks ago and trying to describe where I thought we were, kind of where we were with respect to teacher evaluation and reform. And I said, you know, the best way to describe what I see, frankly, as the lunacy of where we are is to apply it to a different profession. So let's kind of all take a step back for a second and imagine that instead of talking about education, we're talking about medicine. So the equivalent would be, um, and because I'm from Maryland, I'm going to be biased and choose Hopkins, um, that we've got this great doctor of the year, the cardiologist of the year, and he resides at Hopkins, and he does these amazing surgeries and can save people's lives, and he's remarkable and has this great track record. He happens to have 10 specialized nurses, four operating theaters, endless resources at his disposal, and his record is amazing. Well, seeing this, the medical profession jumps in and says, you know, we have a cardiology problem in Alabama. That's where we need you. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to remove you from Johns Hopkins, and we're going to move you to Alabama. And he says, great, that sounds good. And they said, but we don't really have the same resources in Alabama, so we're not giving you four operating theaters. We're going to give you a large air-conditioned tent. And then they say, and we don't really have all the same specialized nurses that you have at Johns Hopkins, but we're going to give you, like, four high school graduates who are really enthusiastic, and we've taught them about sterilization. <laughs> and we are going to, of course, your patients will be a little bit different. Oh, we don't have a waiting room. Um, but it's okay, so while you're doing the surgery, you're going to have a few distracted people who are, you know, having slight heart problems sitting around and, you know, waiting for you to operate on them in great levels of distress. Um, and we're going to expect, you know, more or less the same track record, and we're going to look back over here and see how you're doing. Oh, wait! Oh, and we forgot to tell you that most of the patients you're having are not going to go home to support their families with great ways to make sure they check their blood pressure all the time. You should probably expect that they might not actually take any of the medicine you're prescribing, and many of them can't afford it. Um, and they might not have anyone to help them put their feet up at night or eat what they're supposed to be eating. And in a year from now, we're going to grade you. And we're going to see, we assume that you're going to be able to have exactly the same record that you had in Baltimore. That actually, I think, is a pretty fair analogy to where we are with testing and accountability. And I, what it really made me scared of was to think, what if we did apply that in the medical profession? I think it would scare all of us to death. I think it should scare all of us to death. And I think... Part of what <laughs> I think part of what Diane has done in this book is to kind of make some of that clear and make this accessible to us. Uh, this book also comes at a really opportune moment. Randy noted um, this very, I don't even know what to call it, shocking and disturbing study that just came out. In case anyone hasn't seen it, I know this probably isn't big enough, but the main statistics look like this. And basically what they show us is that just over the last decade, We've gone from being the richest country in the world in which, in four states, which by the way is still completely unacceptable in this country, in which more than half of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. More than half of those students in the entire states are poor. Only 11 years later, that number jumped to 17. And that number now includes every state in the South, except for Virginia and Maryland, if we still consider them Southern and virtually every state in the West, and a bunch of others. It also includes most of our really big states. And by the way, the states in which not more than 50% of the kids are poor 
almost all of those states, at least 30, if not 40% of the kids are poor, and the only state in the whole country that doesn't fall there is New Hampshire. So it is really hard to think of a time when we more need information and evidence about the impacts of student poverty on education, because boy, do we have an excess of student poverty. Of course, from my personal perspective, as the coordinator of the broader, bolder approach to education, thank you, Randy, for multiple plugs. Um, this book was also a fantastic thing for us because it hammers home what we've been saying for several years, and it really dovetails with two big reports we put out this year. And I'm going to talk very, very, you know, give a couple sentences on each because I think that they really affirm um, a lot of what Diane's talking about. Uh, earlier this year, we put out a big report talking about outcomes, student outcomes, in the three big, we'll call them pioneer reform cities, New York City, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. We looked at NAEP scores, which they ended a fantastic job of explaining why we should be looking at NAEP scores, and found that rather than counter to these fantastic claims of the reformers, not only weren't these students making huge gains, they made the smallest gains of students in any big, high-poverty, heavily minority city in the country. Not only did they make the smallest gains, but overwhelmingly, what small gains they made accrued to the wrong students. The reformers were telling us this would be great. It would narrow achievement gaps. It would help minority students. It would help low-income students. Who are the only students who benefited, by and large? Kids who were already doing better. The white students did better. The higher-income students did better. The Asian students did better. And on top of that devastating statistical information, the school closures were destroying neighborhoods, were devastating kids, were disrupting lives that were already heavily disrupted. Later this year, about a month ago, we put out a report on race to the top that obviously applies to more states, 11 states and the District of Columbia, looking at the first three years of implementation. Now, of course, we're not yet looking at NAEP scores, although we'll certainly be interested to see when they come out to look at the next batch. But what we did find was this same mismatch, this same kind of lack of reality between what was being said at the state and federal level and what was happening at the district and school level where these glowing reports of fantastic teacher evaluations and great systems and wonderful data and huge student progress were being proclaimed by the Department of Education. Arnie Duncan wrote a pretty big blog in Huffington Post, if anyone didn't see it, proclaiming success in Tennessee, um, even though Tennessee made no progress on NAEP in four years whatsoever. Um, and at the district and school level, we talked to people, they were as distressed as I've ever heard people talk about, and especially in Tennessee, where it was extremely intense, where test scores are being applied place after place, not just at the teacher level and the student level, but to principals and to entire schools and to entire districts, and to determine schools to be closed and determine districts to be punished, and now they even incorporate them into students' grades. I mean, you know, it's just like a mania, um, and parents are fed up and are protesting, and the day after our report was released, more than half of all of the superintendents in the state of Tennessee wrote a letter to their governor saying, we have had it cut it out, either get rid of our commissioner or tell him to stop it. So I don't want to go on because I think we have some great questions for Diane. I guess my question would be, my two questions to her would be, A, how can we all use this to convince more skeptics? Um, and my second one would be, where do we go from here? And I want to end on a very hopeful note because I'm going into my third year here and I've seen, to me at least, and I think Diane's seeing some of it and I know Randy's seeing some of it, huge change in the last year or two, where really the tide has turned so tremendously to our side. And I think what I would have said three years ago was a bunch of disparate attempts to do what Diane's doing, Randy's doing, and I'm doing, is now really coalescing into an, a really, really powerful movement, um, I think with the potential even to overcome the amount of money that's still on the other side. And so I will end on that note. Thank you. So we need people to uh, take their cards with their questions and pass them to the aisle. And this young man, Christian, will uh, collect them. Uh, I'm going to start out with a question, which um, and I, I want to tee it up um, because Diana, it, uh, you had a lot of passion for the critique, and one of the great things about your book and one of the motivations was to be able to lay out an agenda. Uh, a positive agenda. So the question is, uh, why do reformers not acknowledge poverty? And what does education policy look like if we acknowledge the role of policy and incorporate it? Uh, and, uh, you know, such that uh, we're not living up to what we're accused of saying, which is uh, we'll deal with make better schools once we have socialism. 
So before we get to socialism, what can we do? Um, first of all, I want to thank Elaine because uh, during the course of writing the book, I uh, frequently would shoot her an email and I would say, I need the answer to the question, I need it tonight. And she'd say, can I have 24 hours? And I'd say, okay, 24 hours. <laughs> uh, but I uh, certainly used a lot of the wonderful research that she's done, and it became more and more evident as I was working through the book uh, that what mattered most was um, that schools can't do it alone. I believe passionately in schools. I believe that teachers make a difference in the lives of children. And I know that they cannot do it alone. It requires a society-wide effort. Uh, I, I have a series of recommendations towards the end of the book um, in which I suggest we should have prenatal care for all women who can't afford it because um, they will, as the evidence shows, and I have research for all of this, <coughs> women who don't have prenatal care are apt to have children who have cognitive delays, cognitive deficiencies, and who will be placed in special education. And not only will their lives be ruined, but uh, will cost our society hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, where a small investment up front would have given them healthy babies. So that's a good start. There are many, many other programs, uh, some of which uh, are early childhood education. Uh, the, over the evidence, despite what you may have read yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, is overwhelming. Um, every other country and every country in Europe and many countries around the world uh, have very high quality early childhood education programs. Uh, when The Economist did a ranking, they found that we were number, I think it was 34 out of 45 amongst the countries they ranked. Uh, in terms of providing a good prenatal care quality, uh, the UN ranked as number 131 out of 184. Uh, we were tied with Somalia. I mean, this is disgraceful. Uh, so we, <clears throat> there's so much that we can do in the society. I also happen to think, and I didn't get into this because I'm not expert enough to do it, and I leave it to Larry to do this. Uh, we have to change the tax structure in this country. I think it's a terrible thing. I mean, it's nice for them uh, that there are so many billionaires. I think a person should be able to have a pretty good lifestyle with only 100 million. <laughs> I mean, you just don't need 10, 20, 30 billion dollars. Uh, you, you can't have enough lifetimes to, to do that. I also think that a lot of, of the nonprofits that are actively engaging in political action uh, on behalf of destroying our public school system should, be ta should not be tax exempt. They should be uh, taxed like uh, uh, you know, any other kind of political action group. As far as improving the lives of children, it involves both schools and society. Uh, schools that have kids who, come, who have high needs uh, should have social workers, psychologists, guidance counselors, libraries, librarians. Uh, they should have a vibrant program of the arts. Kids need to have a reason to come to school. They don't want to come to school just to be tested and prepared for the next test. Uh, and yet these are the schools that so often lose their arts programs. And it's the first thing to go, which is pathetic. Uh, on, uh, and uh, I do think that we have to direct, uh, directly address the problem of poverty and also racial segregation. Uh, as Richard Rothstein has written, uh, so much of the segregation, racial segregation in our society was created by federal policy and by state policy. It should be undone by federal and state policy. And that's why I just wish that the race at the top had focused on, uh, particularly on segregation, because that, that would have been we would have seen measurable, measurable progress over the past few years, whereas we're seeing uh, virtually none. And race at the top will go down as an entry in the Museum of Failed Educational Ideas. Um, but I think there are many things that, that our society can do to help children, but it in re requires giving them and their families the supports that they need to have healthy lives and to be able to hold their heads up with dignity, to have food on the table, to have the medical care they need, I'd like to see uh, Bill Gates or Eli Broad open a health clinic in every poor neighborhood in the country. That would be a good start, too. Randy and Elaine, maybe if you want to add anything on uh, how do we take into account poverty in formulating uh, more effective schools? I mean, I think the only thing I would add is the big argument we hear, as Larry said, is that. Um, we, we hear many, first we hear poverty is an excuse, which I think we hear a little bit less because it's becoming harder and harder. Um, and then we hear that's fine, you know, but we need to fix schools first. And I think our, 
biggest point is that's the most inefficient thing possible. Um, as Diane just said, if we if we try to fix schools before we try to address issues of poverty, it means that we'll continue to have half our children come to kindergarten unprepared. So then we're automatically putting these even hypothetically great teachers in a terrible position of teaching three grades of kids in kindergarten. Um, we have these fantastic teachers, and if we don't address health issues or nutrition issues, a quarter of their seats are empty every day. So we have these great teachers teaching empty seats. How is that cost effective? And then at the end of the year, for all those kids who have nowhere to go in the summer, no enrichment, no building on, they lose all the ground that these great teachers gave them. So the most inefficient thing we could possibly do would be to separate the, the sort of both and that we talk about, the in-school and out-school work together. Um, it, it's really, it's ludicrous, it's cost inefficient, it's, it's just frankly the stupidest thing we could do, but it's unfortunately what we're doing now. So, um, as far as, as, as Elaine was answering, I was actually remembering back to one meeting I had this year which I found to be most interesting. It can't hear you. Which I found to be most interesting. It was a private meeting with many mayors from across the country. And I expected them, um, who are members of the League of, League of Mayors, and I expected, frankly, to be peppered with the same questions of, you know, why are you against vouchers and why doesn't market philosophy and test-based accountability and all these things work. And I expected a fairly, you know, a debate. What happened instead, Barry, is that they were as concerned about the issue of poverty as your question suggested. And trying to really think through how you do a both-end um, uh, strategy here. Because we do know, as Diane said, as Lane said, that two-thirds of the achievement gap is based or rooted in social economic issues. So if that is true, we have to actually um, have high-quality public schools with real attention to what can we do to help mitigate and help do things that are about issues that traditional public schools have never addressed. And that's part of the reason why I think that there's three or four things that one could do that we have research on right now. That's why I think there's all this kind of push on early childhood education, but frankly done right. I think it will be a real problem if kindergarten becomes test-taking enterprise. <laughs> I think it's the, the notion about early childhood is these are when kids' minds are so supple that you actually do what we need to do in terms of the things that kids need, which is relationship building, um, engagement. And so early childhood, three, four, five-year-old, really important but done developmentally right. And full day pre-K, really important because of an attention to the custodial obligations we have in schools. And the second thing is, this whole notion of wraparound services and making the school like the old settlement house, making the school the center of community. And I saw a school actually in Florida, a high school, where the gym is actually used for um, the, um, the seniors in the community when it's not being used for kids. And the gym becomes, or the gym becomes a center of community. So the last thing I'll say is, one of the things I was most disappointed about in terms of the mayoral control initiatives that many mayors did around the country, including our own, was that they didn't use the authority they, they then had to create wraparound services really easily and really quickly in terms of this. And so there are, and that gets me back to, that's what these mayors were saying. How can we actually address and mitigate poverty? But I would argue, let's give up the ghost and make schools, public education, the center of communities, where we do the wraparound services and do a lot of these things so the schools become the center to do a lot of these things. Uh, very kind of you know, what people sometimes say, what can the private sector do to help? And I think of all these corporate heads who say, we can't find the talent we need, and that's why we're sending all the jobs overseas. They should stop sending the jobs overseas so there'd be good jobs for kids to grow into once they graduate high school. <laughs> and 
and the other point, if I may make it, is Actually, course, they can get the talent if they're just willing to pay a little bit more. Exactly. <laughs> sure. They, they want to have engineers yeah, that they can hire for $25,000 a year, or workers who will pay for, uh, who will work uh, as they do in China for 10 or $15 a day, and Americans don't do that. Uh, but the other point is the one that, that I quote from John Dewey in the beginning of my book, where he says, what the best and wisest parent wants for his child is what we should want for all the children of our community. Anything less is unlovely and acted upon destroys our democracy. Uh, when I hear people who went to the very finest private schools where they had one teacher for 12 children, where they had beautiful campuses, wonderful arts programs, saying that these kids, those kids, the kids they don't identify with, should be in a boot camp where they have to walk the line, look straight ahead, and, and act as if they're in the military when they're only 10 years old. Well, I'd like to see them switch places. I'd like to see that these kids, our kids, all of our kids, have the advantages that the children of the very wealthy have in their schools. They know what they, they want for their children. They should want it for all children. I thought you were a great visionary. Um, uh, here's, here's another question for you, Diane. What, what are the ways that the profiteers are taking over education, and what results are they getting? Well, there are probably the worst scam of all is the online virtual charter schools. Uh, there are a number of states that have them. Uh, they provide a very inferior quality of education, but they're incredibly profitable. Uh, the biggest of them is a company called K-12. It's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It makes a lot of money. It was founded by the Milken Brothers. You may remember Michael Milken, the junk bond king. He's now an educator. Uh, and uh, he enrolls, I forget how many thousands of students, and they 50% drop out every year. They get low test scores. Uh, they have low graduation rates. They're not good schools. Uh, and yet they make a lot of money. The CEO of the company is paid $5 million a year. His educational background is McKinsey and Goldman Sachs. Uh, so that's one way. Another way is that in Michigan, uh, more than 80% of the charter schools are operated for profit. And the governor of Michigan has given several districts that fell into deficit. Instead of helping the districts out, he gave the entire district to for-profit charter chains, which will extract as profit exactly what the deficit was. Um, and it just by coincidence, all of these districts are districts populated by black children. He wouldn't dare do it to a white suburban district. Uh, Diane, you've been going around the country, uh, uh, talking in many, many different cities. What strategies? have you seen by those who want to defend public education that you see has most effective? What tactics are they using? What are the organizational forms? Do you have any examples you want to offer of uh, places which are um, you know, in the lead in, in, in resisting? Well, interestingly enough, the most effective uh, resistance has come thus far in Texas, uh, where when they extended the high stakes testing to everybody instead of uh, they, they said 15, kids had to pass 15 tests in order to graduate high school. And that got to the suburban moms. I mean, the legislature could ignore the inner city moms, they didn't care. But when it got to the suburban moms, the suburban moms and the urban moms got together and legislators couldn't go anywhere without being buttonholed by somebody, some parent. And the moms formed a group which is, has an unpronounceable name. It's called Texas Advocating. Texans Advocating for Meaningful Student Assessment. It's known as, my, as Moms Against Drunk Testing. <laughs> <laughs> and because of the activism of these parents, the legislature rolled the testing back from 15 to 5. Uh, I think we're going to see the same kind of activism in other parts of the country. Uh, the Providence oh, no. Student Union, which is a high school group, has been unbelievable in terms of their... Uh, political theater. Uh, they've done demonstrations and against the standardized use of a standardized test for uh, high school graduation. Uh, they did a zombie march in front of the Rhode Island Department of Education. That got a lot of attention. Then they got together 60 accomplished professionals to take the kneecap. It's called, believe it or not, the test is called kneecap, <laughs> which kneecaps the students. Uh, so they got 60 accomplished professionals, people who are architects, journalists, legislators, writers, whatever to take the test would make compose or released items and 60% of them failed the high school graduation test. Wow. So, you know, it's this kind of political activism uh, that gets attention, that builds uh, the resistance. I think this coming spring, because of the misuse of testing, 
uh, we're going to see a huge numbers of parents saying, I'm not going to allow my child to take the state test. And frankly, since I've come to believe that the testing provides the data that feeds the vampire, it's like the blood that feeds the vampire, <laughs> I encourage opting out. I wouldn't have done that three years ago. I thought that was crazy. I don't think it's crazy anymore. I think we have to stop this machine. I've even started quoting Mario Savio. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> and uh, Mario Savio was a student leader at Berkeley in 1964, and he said, sometimes the machine becomes so oppressive, you have to throw your body on the machine, stop the levers, stop the gears, make it stop, make it stop. And I have to say, I don't agree with it, Randy, about, uh, I agree about so many things with Randy. I love Randy. <laughs> such a wonderful person. I don't agree with her about accountability. I think accountability today means punishment. We do not need to punish teachers. We do not need to punish children. We do not need to punish schools. And if, you ask, if you ask the people from Finland, how do you hold teachers accountable? They say, accountable? What? We hold, our teachers are responsible. I like that. Uh, uh, people should know that uh, uh, Diane will be signing books after, and there's someone outside in the hallway selling books. Uh, so um, just wait a few more minutes. Uh, Randy, you wanted to say something about so, that? So let me just say, I, I actually believe in 360-degree accountability, and that there has to be communal responsibility, and there has to be collective responsibility for all of our kids. Um, and the accountability systems right now are totally broken. But I do think we actually um, have to have um, we, we actually have to have a long-term accountability system that has credibility from parents, teachers, community, in order to actually have a credible public education system. I don't want to ever see the kind of situation happen as has now happened, where the public square has to own public education again. And that means that people have to feel like the accountability system, the responsibility system, whatever you call it, is really something that is communal, collective, and something that we're all behind. Um, I think that's the way, I mean, I have no, I, I have the same umbrage for the current accountability system as Diane does, but we do actually have to have a way of making sure if we're spending a lot of money on public education, which we should, that taxpayers, parents, and the collective knows that we're spending it for a good reason and we're actually helping kids get what they need to get. So I don't think we to we disagree we disagree on the nomenclature, but not on what is happening right now. I want to hold um, the governors accountable. Well, I do too. <laughs> and, frankly, and frankly, the governors right now in the polling that we've done, um, what's interesting is that we've done a lot of polling of the public and of parents. They most trust teachers and they least trust governors and CEOs. <laughs> but the, the point I wanted to get to is because I'm also really afraid that we don't tea party. Um, we are, a lot of our folks are really, really, really angry about what's going on. And I am going to say the same thing to everyone in this room, as I say, when I am out, you know, kind of summoning up the troops, which is, the polarization around these debates are very, very negative on our side and on other sides. I hate what the Jeb Bushes of the world do. I really hated what Chris Christie did from the floor of the Republican Convention. <coughs> and we are educators, and I don't want us to fall into that same routine. And so I try to be really careful about that. Even though I try to be pretty stark, I try to be really careful about that. The point I wanted to make, though, is I think Diane is right about the kids and the, the moms in, um, in, um, in uh, Texas and the kids in Rhode Island. Um, but I would also look at the moms in Florida who actually pushed back at Parent Trigger twice because they saw it as corporate trigger and they saw it as a way of really hurting their public schools and they actually got both Republican and Democrats to fight back about that as well. And I would also look at that two weeks ago, we had NEA opportunity to learn um, uh, many of the other community groups. We had over 600 people in LA 
including the folks from Seattle, including folks from Philadelphia, from Chicago, from New York, all across the country, 25, in 28 states and 25 cities in particular, so working together on principles of unity of what parents, what looks like community-driven reform that actually really help all children succeed. And so you have a movement that Diane and others have sparked in one regard, but what you're also seeing is people like Kia um, Hinton, a parent from Philadelphia, who's working with lots of student unions and working with our union in Philly, coming up with positive prescriptions for change, as well as calling out what's wrong and coming out with this. And so you're seeing um, real mobilization on the ground all over the place, and I think what you'll see is at the beginning of December, we're going to see a nationwide action in terms of mobilization all over on these issues. And I'll finish off by saying if you want to see some interesting, there are real, there are blueprints out there that are community, you know, really coming from the grassroots up New York City. Um, the New York City A Plus Coalition has an entire blueprint um, from basically bringing together the best evidence from scholarship and combining it with what the public really wants and doing it in a really community-oriented way. Um, in Philadelphia, a coalition whose acronym is PCAPS um, really has done the same thing, bringing together real evidence of what works and what doesn't work, and I think putting one of the most cogent criticisms of what's going on in Philadelphia, yeah. combining that with how that same money, or even less money, could be used to make education actually work for all kids in Philadelphia, especially the kids who need it most. So there's really exciting stuff going on. And the people, I mean, these are the real education experts. These are teachers. These are parents. These are students. People who are in schools every day who are affected by what happens um, are, are taking, you know, taking things into their own hands and making it work. I should add, too, on the accountability front, uh, we have a book called Creating Education by Richard Rothstein, which lays out uh, how, you can, how they do accountability in other countries based on an inspectorate model, not on, you know, I'm an economist, I love numbers, but I don't think numbers actually help you all that much. Um, and uh, the Broader Boulder Approach also had a task force on accountability, which laid out uh, a vision for accountability that is not the narrow test-based accountability that uh, we all find um, uh, disruptive. Um, okay, uh, another question. Um, Hanushek argues that money doesn't matter. <laughs> what say you, Diane? Well, I think he's right. If you have money, it doesn't matter. <laughs> If you're poor, it matters a great deal. Yeah. If you're teaching in a school where the kids come to school and they didn't have breakfast, and they're not sure if they'll have dinner, yeah. and they have never been to a doctor, and they have vision problems and hearing problems and dental problems, it matters a great deal. So, when, you know, my first axiom is correct. If you have, to those people who have a lot of money, it really doesn't make a difference. They have it. Uh, I was, that was great. So I'll do one more question. Um, so you mentioned the uh, reinstatement by Congress of the uh, qualified teacher uh, provision. Uh, highly qualified. Highly qualified. Highly qualified. <laughs> what, what impact will that have on the profession, <clears throat> and what should we be doing instead? Do you want to take that? So, uh, so a couple of things are really um, craven about what happened. <laughs> Number one is, this was about putting the government back together. It wasn't about putting other little things on it. And in fact, you know, there were a couple of things about fixes for the ACA that were part of the original deal, the bipartisan deal that came out of the Senate. And those things actually got jettisoned um, by the House of Representatives in the light of day. And then this was privately put on. And that says something about the power of um, TFA to deal with you know, its particular little issues. Why did TFA want it so much? Because think about it this way. Under No Child Left Behind, you actually had to have a credential to be highly qualified. Um, this basically says that the TFA folks are exempt from that provision of No Child Left Behind. So let's just call it what it is. Now, 
The real issue becomes, if you look at Finland, you look at Singapore, you look at the places that out-compete us, and you think about common sense, or you think about the, the um, great analogy that Lane gave us before in terms of medicine. Those who are prepared for the work that they try to do professionally are going to do better in terms of that work. And this basically sends the opposite message, where all the research basically says, if you're really prepared for the work you're going to do as a professional, you're going to actually do it better. So that's so you know it's so you have a so you have a political piece here that really should have raised a lot of eyebrows, and you also have something that's running against all the evidence that all these folks say when they say, "Oh, see Pisa," but it is this kind of picking and choosing that Diane was talking about. And I would add something, I think that's important because Randy said, pointed out this was not, this was under the shadows, in the dark and under the light of day. And I think it speaks to something Diane said, which is the enormous contrast between what is being foisted on people in education versus what actual people want. Um, parents do not ask for this. You never go to a cocktail party and hear a nice liberal parent with their kid in a great school saying, I went to my principal and I said, you know what, these TFA teachers are so great. I asked for one in my kid's class. Um, or I asked for my kid to have spelling drills for three hours a day because it works so good in inner city Anacostia. You know, this is not about what the public wants. This is not about what informed parents want. This is not about what's good for students. And we need to, any, I mean, and Randy said and Diane said, it should be a huge flag for everybody anytime the word those kids comes up. These are all our kids. Every one of these kids is our kids. And what's good for the kids who are doing the best is even better for the kids who are not doing well. And that's all we need. No one's asking for anything special, no special dispensation, no whatever. We just want the same stuff. And that's what we're not getting. Um, and you know, that that that's what happens why we have these kind of backhand deals. So I'm still waiting for the study that goes that it's been suggested to us that we do it, but it's not really an economic policy institute kind of thing. <laughs> to go to the schools that the the people funding the charter schools, uh, all those, you know, what, what, are the, what are the schools that they send their kids to? And what do they have? And, and name names. So I, I want to suggest that to uh, the audience. And with that, I also want to just thank Diane, thank the panelists.